There have been 90 disappearances in Amicalola Falls State Park. I was almost 91st. I was cocky. I went off trail because I was experienced enough and besides, it was only a short way. I just wanted to get a closer look at a bright piece of fabric caught on a branch. I don't remember falling. I remember setting my feet on what seemed like a solid log and feeling it give way, and I remember waking up cold and aching on the ground, but the stuff in between was all a blur. I had only intended to go a little while, so I hadn't bothered to warn anyone I was gone. Even better, I could see my phone lying smashed on the rocks not too far from me. Any attempts to sit up brought twin spikes of agony from my spine and my right knee, so I had to just lay there and hurt. The steep walls of the ravine where I landed climbed steeply up to either side of me. Timber clawed one end of the ravine. The other end was a crack barely big enough to look through. The light that leaked in was a sort of clear blue, the kind you get with twilight. How long had I been out? I struggled to pack off my aching body and got out my little silver space blanket. My safety whistle had been clipped to the outside of the pack and broke off in my descent. I had enough food and water for maybe a day or two, that was it. I heard the rocks fall long before I heard the singing. I looked up, terrified that more debris was going to fall through and crush me. No, something was traversing down the logs and rocks packed in the far end of the ravine. It was a man. He crawled headfirst down to me, like a lizard. His legs looked like they had been broken at some point and set wrong, so they stuck out at right angles to his body. In the dim light, I couldn't tell what kind of clothes he had on. He was singing in a rough, dopey voice, singing a song that just went nonsensically on and on. Oh, little fishy fish, he grunted as he scooted down the rocks to me, little itchy fish. Fishy fishy nice and twitchy. Despite my terror at his bizarre behavior and appearance, I called out to him. Hello? Can you give me some help? I'm very badly injured. He didn't respond, just kept singing about the fishy, fishy. Once he hit the floor, he didn't stand up. I don't think he could, not anymore. Now that he was closer, I could finally see his face. He had dirty, bushy facial hair that covered just about everything but his eyes, his watery blue eyes. One always looked off to the left of wherever he was looking, the other didn't look at you, but through you, like you weren't even there. I realized I might be in more trouble than I initially thought. Can you please help me? I asked again. Instead of answering, he hooked my pack away with those thick, bowed arms of his and snuffled all over it. Hey, my pack, hey. I grabbed futilely after it. He pulled the pack to the far corner of the ravine and sat with it, going through all of my stuff. I admit I shouted some not-so-nice things at him, but he didn't even acknowledge I'd said anything. After mouthing almost everything I packed, he suddenly started back up the wall of debris with one of my pack straps in his mouth, leaving me with nothing but the space blanket. I yelled myself hoarse after him, but he didn't come back. I passed an uncomfortable night on the ravine floor, shivering despite the blanket. I don't know what time I woke up, but there was much more light. And finally, I could see how messed up I really was. I could see the underside of the place I'd fallen through, a drift of thick branches and leaves. As I studied it, I realized something. It was man-made. There were cut marks on the ends of branches, and everything was fitted together in straight lines. I was already filled with dread before I heard the singing start up again. Yes, the strange man was back singing about his little fish. I glanced around in a panic, but I couldn't see him. I only realized where he was when the light above me started to dim. I looked up and saw a branch fall across the opening I'd fallen through. The bastard was patching the hole. I shouted at him, but I was powerless to really do anything. Finally, the hole was gone and I was alone again. I listened for the sound of hikers, rangers, anyone that might be passing by. My stomach growled, but my food and water bottle were back in the pack. I risked moving a few times, but agony flared up in my body each time. And hell, even if I could have gotten up, how would I have gotten out? It was a long time before I heard him come back, singing that damn fishy fishy song. He came back in over the debris pile, 
Crawling with such ease it didn't look human. In this stronger light, I could pick out more detail. He wasn't wearing clothes so much as many different pieces of clothing that didn't go together, like a girl's blouse over half his torso and a flannel shirt over the other, all bound together with a camera strap. His belt loops jingled with compasses and safety whistles and carabiners and all sorts of random crap. I wondered if he scavenged it all over the course of many years, or... Or, were they trophies? I was trying to fight down panic at this point. He had made the trap and patched it so no one could easily find me. He wanted me here. Why? What the hell was his game? The man stopped just out of my reach. Oh, little fish, little fish, he sang, crumbling something up in his hands, little kittle fish. Bits of hard matter showered me. I picked one out of my hair and found it was my granola bar. He was tossing food to me like he was feeding a pet. I just stared at him as he finished the granola bar and reached into a tattered fanny pack at his waist. Now bits of meat hit me, smelly meat that was too soft to be jerky but too old to be anything else. I gagged but forced myself not to throw up. I didn't need to starve to death any faster. Little fishy wishy fish. Wishy washy fishy. Now he took out my water bottle and poured it down the side of the rocks. It formed a puddle just out of my reach. I had to struggle my body over to lap it up before it soaked in completely, my back flaring in pain. The water tasted like dead fish. By the time I was done, I looked up and found him already crawling up and away from me, singing about the fish. I picked up the granola bits and made as much of a meal as I could. He came back the next day. And the next. And the next. Time stopped meaning anything. The near starvation and continuing pain from my injuries made me slip into a haze. At some point he stole my space blanket, replacing it with a smelly deer hide. He cut at my blanket into shiny strips that he wound around his clothing like ornaments. After he ran out of my packed food, he brought me more meat and tough roots and a few withered berries. I stopped trying to move on my own because I no longer had the strength to move on my own. I got used to the stab of hunger pains day and night. My body burned with fever and my tongue swelled. Nothing made sense anymore because my brain was not getting enough nutrition to function. I remember one instance I woke up with an odd start. I was too weak to really think straight, but a sudden change in my surroundings had trickled into my brain, waking me. I felt the scratch of hair on my upper lip at the same time something warm and mushy flooded my mouth. I opened my eyes and found the strange man not an inch from face. He backed away, staring past me with those watery blue eyes. Fish snitch catch, he sang, bringing a lump up to his mouth. Fish switch it. I realized the nauseating truth as he grabbed my head and held it still while taking another bite of rancid smelling meat. He was chewing food and putting it directly into my mouth. I wanted to vomit, but even if I'd had the strength for it, I couldn't have. I needed every little bit I could get. He forcefully fed me a few more mouthfuls before going on his merry way. Little fishy fish, he called back to me, fishy fetchy switch. I fell into a fugue again, only waking the next time he put his face to mine. Time passed. I don't know when I first heard the new sound. I was in such a bad shape it felt like every little noise was coming through water. But as I struggled to consciousness, I realized I was hearing something. People talking. I just lay there limp, not even able to process this. People? I was hearing people? What did I do when there were people nearby? I tried calling and realized my throat would only make a weak rasp. I thought of all the whistles rattling from my captor's belt loops and had a bolt of inspiration strike through my fever haze. I tried to whistle, but my lips were so chapped the skin was coming off in sheets. I struggled to move my arm up to my head, expecting the voices to just vanish at any point. I stuck two fingers in my mouth and tried a sports whistle. It made a little noise. I adjusted my fingers and blew harder. The talking stopped. In despair, I whistled more, making wet sounds that barely carried. Did you hear that? Someone said. I cried, wasting precious water. 
I whistled. A park ranger stuck his face in the far end of the ravine, the one too small to squeeze through. He went white. We've got someone down here, he called. The next few hours are a blur. The ranger said he talked to me, tried to keep me conscious as the other ranger legged it down to the station, but everything I said was a word salad. I kept mentioning fish, he said, and traps. They demolished the branch platform above me to pull me out of the ravine. I was dehydrated, malnourished, and was nearing renal failure. Even with extensive surgery, I would never walk right again. They think that I was crying over my lost agency when they broke that news. I wasn't. I was crying for joy because I would never go hiking again. They said they could see signs of human habitation in a cave near the ravine where they found me, a fire built to cook food and bones gnawed to get at the marrow. But nothing more than that. I'm sure they'll never find anything. The man who lives there has obviously been doing it a long time. He knows exactly what he's doing. I'm not telling you to never go hiking, to avoid this one single park, or even to never go anywhere alone. What I'm saying to you is this, there have been 90 disappearances in Amikalola Falls State Park. Don't be the 91st. I have no memories of my parents. They died soon after I was born. As a child, I was placed into what is referred to as the foster care system in the States. In Canada, we call it the Crown Ward, which is basically a child of the state. Here, when a couple requests to be foster parents, they are known as trial parents. This meant they are only awarded one child at first, and if all goes well, they would receive more. I wasn't so lucky. For some reason, the state kept giving me to multiple trial parents, with each one failing to give me basic parenting. This happened over and over again. Always left alone always abandoned. It took a while, but eventually I realized the only thing all of these people cared about was a paycheck. That's all I was. Nothing else. I guess that's why I always felt this emotional void. Empty, like something was missing. Because of this, I felt numb. I've never even had a boyfriend. When I tried dating, I felt nothing. When they kissed me, I felt no joy. Sex, on the rare occasions I let it go that far, turned out to be meaningless. I never felt sad. I never felt happy. Love was just four letters and fear was only something in people's imagination. It was as if I was watching somebody's life play out on a television and I was just there as the spectator. When I entered college, I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life, if you could even call it a life. My dorm roommate told me she wanted to be a nurse. She spoke about it with such passion that it made me want it as well. Hopefully I could find what I was looking for. Whatever that was. When I got my nursing degree, I took the first job that was offered to me. One week later, I was working the night shift in the intensive care unit of a cancer hospital. That's when I met Sam Blaine. Or should I say Sam Blaine's family? Sam was a 62-year-old male who had been diagnosed with lung cancer a year earlier. He'd undergone a round of chemotherapy and his tests from six months ago had looked promising. At exactly 4.32 a.m., however, after I'd been on my job for just over a week, Sam Blaine was admitted with pneumonia. He was accompanied by an attractive older woman, whom I took to be his wife. The doctor on call examined him, took some tests, and confirmed the worst, his cancer had come out of remission. But until his pneumonia had cleared up, he wouldn't be able to start another round of chemo. As the doctor explained all this to his wife, I got Sam set up in a room and I made sure he was comfortable. Then I went to take my breakfast break. At 7.32 a.m., I returned to his room from eating my breakfast and found what must have been his entire family waiting in his room. At his bedside sat his wife. Her gray hair, which had been pulled back in a bun, was coming loose and she hid her teary eyes behind a pair of glasses which rested on the bridge of her nose. Next to her stood a set of twin girls who looked about my age or maybe a bit younger. Both were flowery dresses, a little too formal for my taste. And finally, a man, mid-thirties maybe, who bore a striking resemblance to Sam. It took me a second to notice, but it was definitely the chin. 
He stood on the opposite side of the bed with worry written on his face. I stepped into his room, grabbed the marker, and wrote my name down on the dry erase board. Nurse Joy. This is something I probably should have done hours ago, but Sam was so out of shape because of the morphine to ease his pain that I hadn't bothered. How is he? The wife asked. Any news from the tests? There was a hint of a lovely accent that I hadn't picked up on before and couldn't place. I picked up his chart off the rail of his bed and cleared my throat. I scanned the page, gathering my thoughts on how to properly explain the situation. Then I spoke as gently as I could, going over the details of his condition. The sun cut me off. Why can't he speak? His tone is almost on the verge of whining. He has an infection on his tongue. There's some swelling. A lot of it, actually. Dr. Harden has put him on vancomycin, which is an antibiotic. That should, hopefully, bring down the swelling in a few days. He won't be able to talk much until then. Will that affect his breathing? The wife asked. No. He's breathing perfectly fine through the nasal cannula. That's what we call that plastic thing in his nose. It should suffice for now. Is he going to be okay? One of the girls asked, looking me in the eyes. That question caught me off guard. There were so many variables that could affect the outcome of this situation. But my training took over and told me that I should never directly answer these types of questions. I held her gaze. Dr. Harden is the best doctor in this hospital. If it were my dad? She is who I would want as my doctor, I said. The daughter made a weird noise. Then she covered her mouth and began to cry. As I was about to go into more detail about Sam's condition, his wife abruptly stood up. She moved toward me. Shifting my gaze to her, I cocked my head curiously, wondering what she was doing. And suddenly, she was hugging me in a tight embrace. My mouth parted. My breath caught in my throat. I was so taken back that I couldn't move. Thank you so much, she whispered into my ear. Her tears fell on my collar. My heart rate picked up. An emotion swelled in my chest, though I wasn't sure what it was. I'd never felt like this before. I swallowed. Nodding sharply, I patted her on the back. She pulled away from me and ran her hand down my face. Thank you, she said again, this time with a raspy voice. Reaching into her purse, she pulled out a business card and handed it to me. My cell number is on here, she sniffed. If there are any changes, please call me immediately. Unable to reply, I nodded again. One of the daughters leaned down to the bed, buried her face in her father's chest, and just let everything out. She wept so hard, her body shuddered into his. My eyes widened at what I was witnessing. Throughout my life, I'd never seen this before. This family cared. They cared so much they didn't care about expressing themselves in front of each other. They didn't hide their tears. They loved him. They wanted him to live and make it out of this situation safely. They would do anything for this man. I exhaled, gathering myself. My hands were shaking. I stuffed them into the pockets of my shirt scrubs. The rest of the family stood up. Then each one of them also gave me a hug and thanked me. When I turned to go to check on my other patients, they were still there, gathered round his bed, their eyes filled with tears, holding onto his hands or each other. Speechless, I left them alone. When I got off my shift, I went home to my apartment and thought about what I had seen. That family was so loving. They hugged me just for taking care of Sam, just because it was my job. It made no sense to me. The scene replayed in my head, over and over again. As I sat alone with my quickly cooling cup of tea, gazing out the window, I saw them. A man and a woman, walking close together, not holding hands, but walking as if they belonged in step. Two children scooted back and forth around them, and the man would lean down every so often and pretend to try to grab one of the children. I felt a lump forming in my throat as I turned my back to the window, my attention on my kitchen and the single plate and fork resting in the dish rack. My gaze wandered along my apartment, I remembered I had no pictures of loved ones. 
I knew this was not the case at the Blaine house. They probably had family pictures mounted to the walls or on the fireplace mantel. Or maybe one of those family tree picture collage thingy posted by the front door, displayed to be the first thing seen to all who entered their home. That was love. That is what it must have felt like to be loved. I realized I had a smile plastered to my face I couldn't help it. And I couldn't wait to see them again. The following evening, as soon as I got to work, I rushed into Sam's room. His family was back. I lingered on my rounds to make quite a bit of conversation with them, knowing it was unprofessional, but I wanted to know them better. Since I was Sam's nurse, they easily obliged. The son's name was Sam Jr. He was recently married and worked as a stockbroker. The twins were summer and June, both about to graduate from nursing school. I kept thinking in the back of my mind that we could be sisters. And finally the wife's name was Adelaide. She was a native of Australia. That explained the accent. She and Sam had met there some years ago when his job had sent him overseas. They began dating, fell in love, and the rest was history. She told me that Sam had so many traits that made him a good man. Apparently, he was a good communicator, God-fearing, family-oriented, loving, faithful, selfless, romantic, outgoing, a good cook, strong, patient, helpful, a great provider, and the list went on and on. I told her that I would do whatever was in my power to make sure Sam was taken care of. I picked up his chart. He's getting better, I told Adelaide. With the new medication Dr. Harden has prescribed, we've finally gotten his pneumonia under control. When will he be able to talk, she asked. I bit my lip. His body is not reacting like the doctor wished for the vancomycin. So she's recommending another antibiotic called erythrocin. His first dose was earlier today. At this point, we'll have to wait and see. Her face fell. Oh. Don't worry, I said softly. From everything I've read up on erythrocin, it's the right call. It should do it. Her smile made my heart melt. She mouthed, thank you, and rested her hand on top of mine. It felt warm. Like how a mother's hand should feel. It seeped into mine. For the next few days, Sam's condition got better. With no signs of pneumonia, all we had to do was wait for the tongue infection to subside and then start on the chemotherapy. This was good. This meant he was going to get better. Every evening and many days, his family came to visit. I looked forward to their visits. To their talks. I felt a real connection with Summer and June and even helped with their nursing school homework. Currently, they were working on EKGs. Sam's tongue began to make a gradual improvement. The erythrocin was working, but it was so infected, it would take at least another week before he would be able to speak. The only sound he could make was an odd growl. Sam Jr. said he sounded like Chewbacca on drugs, and we all laughed. Even Sam smiled as best he could. I looked around the family and felt at peace, as though I really belonged here. Then one day, it all changed. Before heading to work, I stopped by a shop and got Sam some flowers. I thought it would please Adelaide that she'd tell me how sweet I was, and I craved her praise. But when I arrived, there was no sign of my family. This was the first time in the past seven days they had not been here. I wonder what had changed. I checked Sam's chart and noticed more improvement. Then it hit me. Since Sam wasn't in immediate danger anymore, his family had no reason to visit him every day. Not even Adelaide came that evening. I sighed and found myself missing them. Yearning to talk to them. To spend time with them. I went home the following morning and all I could do was wonder what Adelaide was doing at that exact moment. Was Sam Jr. working late? Did Summer and June pass their EKG test? It kept me up that day as I tossed and turned in my bed. I felt as if I were being abandoned. Again. And I didn't like it. Not one bit. Fortunately, Adelaide showed up the following evening, though her family didn't. We spent some time talking, but it wasn't the same. She kept giving more attention to Sam since he was more aware and not as medicated. 
I guess the connection I thought we had wasn't as strong as I would have liked. It's okay, she soothed, petting his face. It's going to be okay. Nurse Joy is going to make sure you are okay. And as soon as you know it, you'll be home again. I bit my lip and took a step back. That's when I knew. I was losing them. Soon they would be gone and I would never see them again. Something needed to be done. Perhaps I was doing too good of a job. The following evening, when I arrived at work, I brought a little surprise with me. Once again, his wife and family had not shown up. But, with my help, that was all about to change. As I walked into Sam's room, I closed the door behind me. He was awake, watching an old rerun of a black and white show I was not familiar with. He watched me nervously as I approached him. Must have been the expression on my face that gave it away. I couldn't help but smile. The glare of the flashing television bounced off his face. I pulled out a syringe I had pocketed from the nurse's station. Still with that face, he opened his mouth to say something, but since his tongue was still swollen, he made a weak animal growl. Just another antibiotic for you, I said. It was ricin, a type of poison made from castor beans. It's actually quite easy to make, taken directly out of the pulp. Now if the protein is purified from the beans, and if a very small amount, less than 2 milligrams let's say, is injected, that will be enough to cause significant damage to his organs. Enough to kill him. What is amazing about ricin is that leaves the body after a few hours. But the damage will be long done by then. My smile widened. Pulling the vial out of my jacket, I inserted the needle and pulled on the plunger. When the container was filled, I pulled out the needle, held the syringe upside, and flicked it a couple of times. I gave the plunger a slight push, watching the orange liquid squirt out just a tad. Don't worry, Mr. Blaine. This won't hurt a bit, I said. Then I inserted the needed into his fore and pressed down on the plunger. I stepped back and watched the magic happen. His eyes watered. He whined again gently, almost making me feel sorry for him. But if he wasn't trying to take away my family, I wouldn't have to do this. I smiled at the thought. My family. I patted him on the head and then turned up his morphine. Nighty night, I said. An hour later, he went into a seizure. Then flatlined. Finally, after a couple of rounds of defibrillation, the on-call doctor managed to jumpstart his heart. I called Dr. Harden and reported all of the details, from Sam's having breathing difficulties to the fluid in the lungs. I also explained that he now had an irregular heartbeat as well as low blood pressure. She told me she was on her way and hung up. The on-call doctor wanted to know exactly what was happening with this man and ordered me to get him some blood panels. I nodded before returning to the nurse's station. I waited just long enough for the ricin to be out of his system before ordering them. I knew they would come back clean. But the damage was already done. It was during this time that I switched out his four bag and hid the one that contained the ricin in my locker. When Dr. Harden arrived, she wanted to open him up for exploratory surgery. I called Adelaide and told her what was happening. My new family got to the hospital an hour later, just as Sam's surgery was starting. Adelaide, Sam Jr., Summer, and June were in tears. They wanted hugs and comfort. I gave it to them. As morning broke, I stayed with them after my shift ended to add emotional support. To pass the time, we talked. The twins were doing well in school despite the drama with their dad. I helped them with more of their homework while we waited for some news. The feeling I had been missing the past couple of days returned. This family. My family. They need me. I needed them. Was this love? I didn't know. Sam Jr. seemed to take it the worst. He kept running his fingers through his hair. Look at me, he said softly. I look like deep fried crap. I had no idea what that meant. I put my hand on his knee and squeezed it gently. Things like this happen. There were just too many factors. Nobody could have predicted this. It's nobody's fault. It's mine. 
How so? I should have been here. Come here more. Spend time with him. I just thought Dash. He talked about you, I lied. But his tongue Dash. Was getting better, I finished. We had many, long conversations about you. He loved you. Always remember that. I'll tell you about them someday. His lips pulled back into a warm smile. Please. Dr. Harden finally returned. From the expression on her face, I already knew. I had seen it too many times since I had started working at the hospital. I'm so sorry, Dr. Harden said, her voice soft yet monotone. Oh, God. No, 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 Adelaide said, her voice breaking. His heart stopped in the middle of surgery. Despite our best efforts, Dash. The moment came. Tears burst from Adelaide's eyes, rolling down her cheeks in a torrential downfall. Emotion swelled in my chest. My bottom lip quivered. Seeing Mom this way upset me. I couldn't stop the flow from my eyes as well. I hugged her tightly. We we lost him, I whispered softly. The twins and Sam Jr. came in for a group hug. There was such a range of emotion, I was completely overcome by their sorrow. And by their love. This is what it felt like to have a family. We cried as one. Several hours later, everything was done. From the burial arrangements to the organ donation. Then again, from what was left of his organs, that wasn't happening. Mom approached me. This weekend, we're having a family get together. Would you like to come? She asked. It would mean a lot of us. Sam Jr. told me you were there for him in his final moments. She twiddled her thumbs. I'd like you to tell us what all he said. I swallowed then nodded. Of course. She gave me a gentle smile. Thank you. She turned away with her sad face and my family left. I hadn't realized we'd been here all day and it was time for my shift to start. I went to my locker, grabbed a fresh pair of scrubs and put them on. Even though I was exhausted from the lack of sleep, I had a family now. One that cared about me. I'd be there for Christmas, exchanging gifts with loved ones. There for Thanksgiving dinners. I sniffed as a tear fell from my eye. A happy one. As I began my rounds, I went into my first patient's room and saw a large family gathered around the bed. I stepped into his room, grabbed the marker and wrote my name down on the dry erase board. Nurse Joy. A thought came to me. Since I already had one family, was it possible to have two? I would soon find out. I was a volunteer at the Montview Heritage Aquarium since sophomore year of high school. It was equal parts devotion and gullibility that kept me going. Even though my dreams of becoming a marine biologist fizzled out once I left high school, I stayed loyal to that place, believing them every time they said a job opening was just around the corner. The touch tank is the exhibit that all the kids love. Some starfish sand dollars, maybe an urchin or two that you can pick up and fondle and no one will tell you to put it down. pH is always a nightmare. Sometimes you have to skim greasy blobs of peanut butter sandwiches off the filter. I've fished band-aids out of the pool more times than I can count. But the animals can usually take it. When they can't, well, you can always replace a sand dollar. Management at that place was hell. Did a kid pick up a starfish and break off three legs for no reason? Comp his family and give them stickers. Someone spit in the water? Free lunch at the cafe. The customer must be kept happy and come back, no matter the cost. I guess this was why it took so long to notice what went wrong with the tank. I was so used to no one caring that I had given up most of my efforts and just settled for making sure the animals survived the day. I remember not feeling angry when I saw the pulverized bits of starfish floating in the water, just tired and sick. I skimmed the remains out with a net and rinsed the filter. A elementary class was coming by in 10 minutes, no time to do anything else. It was exactly 12.15. I was glancing up at the clock, anticipating sweet freedom when the school children went back to their bus for sack lunches because the school was too cheap to spring for the cafe. 
The second hand of the clock ticked and I heard a funny little squeak. I looked over to find a girl backing away from the touch tank, the front of her jacket sopping wet, looking down at her hand. The edge of it was bright pink and beginning to puff up. Oh no. The girl was making those little sharp noises that you make when you're in too much pain to scream. I could see several red dots along her hand, like she'd been stabbed with a comb. I tried to talk calmly to her, maneuver her down to the first aid station, while the other children just stared at us. One of the supervising teachers took the girl's arm and led her away. I managed to get the class out of there and over to the deep sea tanks. When I got back to the touch tank, the remains of another starfish floated on the water. I closed the tank down, put a slipcover over the top. Management argued with me until the ambulance came to get the girl, who could no longer feel her hand and had trouble breathing. The girl cried that the feather had hurt her, she'd seen it floating in the water and it stung when she touched it. I closed down the tank, the aquarium issued day passes for the whole class. The next day was supposed to be my day off. I came in and drained the tank, putting all my invertebrate friends in holding tanks. It was all too obvious to me who the culprit was. Starfish slurry and a mysterious underwater feather? It could only be a polychaete, the bobbit worm. Nasty suckers. I have friends with saltwater tanks. Bobbit worms are pretty much the boogeyman to them. They can stow away on a piece of coral when they're about an inch long and you won't even know you have one until your fish start disappearing. I drained the tank, took apart all the fixtures to search for it. The tank was a mixture of natural and machined rocks, with lots of nooks and crannies. I wore thick gloves and poked a dental pick into every hollow I found. Nothing. I raked the sand, ran it through sieves. Nada. I took the filter completely apart, blasting compressed air through the parts one couldn't remove from the wall mount. Zip. I really wanted to close the tank down until I could find this thing. Polychaete stings could lead to permanent numbness, paralysis, even death. But no. The aquarium couldn't close down the touch tank for something I didn't even see firsthand. Besides, the girl had signed a waiver, legally they had no reason to close the tank. Let me just say there was a reason the aquarium ran mostly on volunteer work. I spent the next few days watching the touch tank like a hawk, paranoid of every hand put in its waters. I knew it was wrong to keep it open, but I told myself that as long as I was there it would be okay. Yeah, working at that place really did a number on my head. I didn't have any more bobbit worm encounters. No, what came next was even weirder. Richie, the guy who was in charge of the quarantine tanks, pulled me aside one day. Could I show you something? I thought it would be another leak repaired with tape. No, Richie had some video to show me. The school of clownfish had been disappearing from their tank in quarantine until Richie had to spring for a webcam himself to catch the culprit in action. The video started at about 4 a.m. From the angle of the camera, you mostly saw the clownfish tank. Beyond that, you could just see a sliver of the door and the floor and the thing that squeezed beneath the door like a living blob of ink. It disappeared from the frame for a while, then it reappeared climbing up the walls of the tank. It looked like a small, black octopus, except it wasn't an octopus. It had four tentacles, and that was it. No stumps or scars to show where tentacles had been. The, I guess you'd call it a quintopus, had these purple eyes that shone like jewels, even in the terrible video of the webcam. It got to the lid of the tank and opened it. The quintopus sent a single tentacle down into the water. The end stretched into a thin string and suddenly became bright pink. It was wiggling. One of the hapless clownfish finally took the bait. Faster than I could see, the quintopus speared it completely through the head with another tentacle. As we watched, it snatched up four more fish and then slipped out the way it came. The whole thing took less than five minutes. I asked Richie if he'd found any sign of where it had gone after that. Oh yeah. Richie nodded at the place where the trail of seawater had ended. The touch tank. I closed the tank off for a few hours and found nothing, of course. Richie was put on warning for losing fish, couldn't get anyone to watch his video. I got really paranoid. Cleaned the filter every day. 
stopped taking breaks, jumped every time someone put their hands in the water. I knew something was going on with that tank, something beyond my knowledge, and I had no power to stop it or make it go away. If I complained, they'd dismiss me. If I reported it, they wouldn't find anything. All I could do was be watchful, and in the end it still wasn't enough. A bit of conversation hit my ears a few days after that, immediately filled my stomach with dread. Look mommy, it's a pillow. That's a sea cucumber, honey. The tank didn't have sea cucumbers. I turned and found a little girl cooing over a bright yellow oval studded with blue pustules. It felt like I was moving in slow motion. I was putting my hand out and the word stop was in my mouth when she squeezed it. The pustules inflated with fluid and exploded. The water turned thick and a sweet chemical smell hit my nose. The girl's skin was purple where the fluid had landed. She was crying from pain or fear as the woman scrubbed away with the hem of her shirt, trying to keep the fluid off. I screamed for everyone to take their hands out of the tank right goddamn now. Now some of the other children were crying. The water got a white tinge. Everything. Every single invertebrate in that tank died. I drained it, scrubbed it, put it back together again. I found nothing. Nothing at all. The girl went to the hospital with chemical burns. I tried, I really tried to make them see. They blamed me for the girl's injury, accused me of smuggling in a dangerous species. They simultaneously accused me of being lazy and too meticulous. They reminded me I was a volunteer, not an expert, and I was lucky they had retained me so long. I stayed. I restocked that damn tank and I watched over it. Know why? Because if I didn't, they'd get someone else to do it. Someone who didn't know what was going on. I couldn't stomach that. There's a thousand and one little things that led up to the day the tank finally went out in a blaze of glory, a thousand little incidents that are hardly stories in their own right. The strange black crabs that looked like they were made of metal and let out a horrible smell when I picked them up. The clams that sliced my hand open when I picked them up. The thing that looked like a dead fish floating on the water that suddenly changed color and darted away when I went after it with the net. But the only story I really need to tell is the one that made me destroy that tank and never look back. The Poseidon Club. A bunch of old farts who own yachts and think they're the gods of the sea. The aquarium closed down early and served shrimp cocktails near the open ocean tank. Fun. I didn't want to open the touch tank. I kept the slip cloth over it at all times now, only taking it off when they made me. Well, they made me that night. The club's donations kept the aquarium open for business, so it was off with the cloth. There was water on the floor all around the tank as I walked up, lots of it. Bad sign. I peeled the slip cloth back, waiting for spines or some kind of venom to shoot at my face. Nothing. The floor of the tank was completely bare, every invertebrate was clustered up on the rocks and off the sand. The sand was arranged in odd patterns, not sitting flat on the floor of the tank, and two large round black things, each the size of my fist, sat on the side closest to me. I just stared at the sand, not comprehending why I was filling with dread. The truth hit me in the same way you look at one of those magic eye pictures until the image jumps out at you. Stonefish, the ugly bastards that sit buried on the ocean floor, waiting for a fish or unlucky foot to shoot full of spines and I was looking at one that took up the entire floor of the tank. I stopped thinking. I was just picturing all those hands plunging into the water, crunching into spines and releasing venom or God knows what else into the water. I got two sides of the tank before they came running up. I had grabbed the fire axe off the wall and I laid into it. I smashed the walls, the rocks, even the filter. The invertebrates fell squirming to the floor, but they would survive a few minutes in open air. They had survived worse. It's hard to describe what the fish did. As the water drained from the broken glass, it sort of turned and slid beneath the rocks at the opposite side of the tank. The rocks I knew for a fact had no opening beneath them. I made sure to pulverize them good, leaving no hiding place. When the axe was finally yanked from my hands, I had split the tank apart and found nothing there that shouldn't be there. 
Montview Aquarium is still there if you walk down 8th Street past the art galleries. It keeps, pardon the pun, afloat, but only barely. Turns out those waivers weren't as airtight as they thought, and they lost a lot in those suits. I was subpoenaed but never got a chance to testify. Shame. Maybe if they had spent less time slandering me in court, they could have built an adequate defense. But no, even now the aquarium will swear that they had an unstable employee that let safety lapse and finally exploded in violence, how they are the tragic victims of vexatious litigation. They swear that there was never anything wrong with the fish or the aquarium, but they never rebuilt that touch tank.